Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that your word is God-breathed. That, Lord, you have, you have spoken to us through your word. I pray this morning, as we look at your word, that, Lord, you would open it up to us, that your Holy Spirit would, would drive it home, that you would bring peace to us, you would bring hope to us through your word. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. On December 8th, 2021, the Canadian House of Commons passed Bill C-4. It's called an act to amend the criminal code considering conversion therapy. And I'm quoting from the official website of the Canadian Par Parliament summary of what this bill was specifically dealing with. It says, this enactment amends the criminal code to, among other things, create the following offenses. Now, A, causing another person to undergo conversion therapy. B, doing anything for the purpose of removing a child from Canada with the intention that the child undergo conversion therapy outside of Canada. And C, promoting or advertising conversion therapy and D, receiving a financial or other material benefit from the prov provision of conversion therapy. And it also amends the criminal code to authorize courts to, to order those advertisements for conversion therapy to be disposed of or deleted. And it has a preamble as well. It says, whereas conversion therapy causes harm to the persons who are subjected to it, Whereas conversion therapy causes harm to society because, among other things, it's based on and propagates myths and stereotypes about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, including the myth that heterosexuality, cisgender gender identity, and gender expression that conforms to the sex assigned to a person at birth are to be preferred over other sexual orientations, gender identities, and gender expressions. And whereas in light of these harms, it's important to discourage and denounce the provision of conversion therapy in order to protect the human dignity and equality of all Canadians. Now, therefore, Her Majesty, by and with the advice and consent of the Senate and House of Commons of Canada, enacts as follows. And the as follows is a lengthy description of the criminal code they have created concerning conversion therapy. It goes on into great detail about the new criminal code and what it covers, but I won't take the time to describe that, but I want to read to you the response in a letter published by the Liberty Coalition, uh, Coalition of Canada, which is a group of evangelical pastors. So this bill's wording is sufficiently broad to allow for the criminal prosecution of Christians who would speak biblical truth into the lives of those in bondage to sexual sins like homosexuality and transgenderism. Even a mother or father who offers their children freedom from sexual sin through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ should be threatened with five years in jail. This letter continues with rebukes to the members of Parliament who unanimously rushed Bill C-4 through the House of Commons last month without any debate or public input. They write, our king and head is greatly displeased with our members of parliament for their sinful disregard for the spiritual and eternal well-being of Canadians. It's important to note that they've also committed high blasphemy by referring to biblical teaching as myths in this legislation. We all must therefore tremble to consider what terrifying judgments will be visited upon our nation for this bold gesture of hatred towards the Most High God. Many of you have probably, probably been reading about what's happening in Finland. In, the, in Finland, a pastor and a member of parliament are being put on trial because of their faith in Jesus Christ. This is a huge news for all Christians from around the world because certainly this will not stay in Finland, but will spread, spread across the globe. If we do not stand firmly for our faith and the Lordship of Jesus Christ, 
the fact that the, the world is raging against us, we must stay the course. And perhaps is even more concerning is what the charges are concerned with. And now I'm quoting from an article from the Freedom First Network. Their alleged crimes in a country that claims to guarantee freedom of speech and religion included tweeting a picture of a Bible verse. Potential penalty, penalties, if they are convicted, include fines and up to two years in prison. They are being charged with hate speech for respectively writing and publishing a 24-page booklet written in 2004 that explains basic Christian theology about sex and marriage, which reserves sex exclusively for within marriage, which can only consist of one man and one woman for life. And the Finnish prosecutor claims centuries-old Christian teachings about sex incite hatred and violate legal preferences for government-privileged identity groups. I wanted to begin with these two examples of what's going on with our neighbors in Canada and those in Finland. Even though I, I could spend more time this morning on, uh, with equally egregious examples from around the world. Christianity Today, in, in January 13th, 2021 edition, wrote that the 50 countries where it's most dangerous to follow Jesus in 2021. The truth is that we should not be shocked about this recent events. We should not even be surprised. We should remember that in all of history, those who choose to follow Jesus Christ always come under attack from those who choose to follow the prince of darkness, even unknowingly. In our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 10, we see the young Jeremiah assuring God that he was not the right man to be a prophet. So, our oh Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I'm only a youth. And he was likely in his late teens or maybe in his early 20s, but he was old enough to realize that earlier prophets in Israel and in Judah had not been received well and were usually killed. He probably subject, just assumed that he would not be the exception to the rule. However, ever it was clear that God would not let him walk away from the calling he had upon his life. Listen again to verses 7 to 9. But the Lord say to me, do not say I'm only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Talk about not feeling qualified. <laughs> In truth, Jeremiah suffered all kinds of abuse and was not only ignored but mistreated. It was by those who, whom he brought God's message, those who believed they were the children of God. And he was persecuted because the message of God was that they might be saved, that they might be guided into truth, and they wanted no part of it. I love the honest relationship that Jeremiah had with God. He was obedient, but sometimes he had just had enough. I mean, listen to the complaint to God in Jeremiah 20, 7 to 10. Oh, Lord, you have deceived me, and I was deceived. You are stronger than I, and you have prevailed. I have become a laughingstock all the day. Everyone mocks me, for whenever I speak, I cry, I cry out. I shout violence and destruction. For the word of the Lord has become for me a reproach and a derision all day long. If I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, there is in my heart as if it were a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I am weary with holding it in, and I cannot. For I hear many whisperings, terror is on every side. Denounce him, denounce him, let's denounce him. Say all my close friends, watching from my fall, 
Perhaps he'll be deceived, and then we can overcome him and take our revenge upon him. He was referred to as the weeping prophet. That's usually assigned to Jeremiah. But his tears were not merely born out of frustration, but oddly enough, were primarily a revelation of the love he had for the people in Israel and Judah. Some have suggested that it was it's evidence of inner weakness and loneliness. But I think it ran much deeper and was a result of grieving for the spiritual state of God's chosen people. Even though Jeremiah often complained about his life as God's prophet or condemned his adversaries, we shouldn't place much emphasis on that. He did as the Lord commanded him, even when he didn't really want to. The later comparison is made between him and Jesus in Matthew 16, 14. And it shows us that his reputation must have included the attribute of courage as well as tenderness. He remained what the Lord made of him. And in Jeremiah 1.18, God tells him what he's going to be. He says, you're going to be a, a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. F.B. Huey in his commentary of Jeremiah suggests, evaluated by most standards of success, Jeremiah was an abysmal failure, but judged by God's standard. However, he stood, he stood tall, and he still does. He remained faithful. The great rulers of Jeremiah's day, Ashurbanipal, Nebuchadnezzar, Necho, and Hophra, have largely been forgotten. Their influence is nil. Whereas Jeremiah's name and influence remain because of his obedience to God's will for him. So let's now turn to our gospel reading from Luke chapter 4, 21 to 32. I mean, last week we considered Jesus returning to his hometown in Nazareth and his teaching in the synagogue there. As a reminder, let's read Luke 4, 17 to 21. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogues were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, truly today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And that's where we're going to begin this morning with that last verse. Now, as I pointed out last week, Jesus has claimed that today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing was a very bold statement that places both the listeners and the readers in the position of having to make a choice. I mentioned last week that those who are looking to God for hope, Jesus was the answer. To respond to God, one must be open up to him. For those in need of God, Jesus has a message of good news. Luke loves to emphasize that a potential audience for this message can be found amongst the poor. And his social concern expresses itself fully through the details of what Jesus said in the synagogue. It details that other gospels lack. But his social concern is primarily spiritual and not political ideologies. Jesus he was claiming to be the fulfillment of Isaiah 61, 1-2, where God would come to his people and bring them out of exile into a time of tremendous blessings. If he was telling the truth that this was indeed good news, because they were promised to have God's favor once again as his chosen people. But had they learned the lessons of what happened when they turned away from God's laws to worship other gods that were made of wood or stone or metal? In other words, they were not gods at all. 
Would they see that they could not have one foot in a life where Jesus was Lord of all things and the other foot in a camp where all the things of the world became their desire? It would be imperative that they understood. And it's for us today as well that Jesus was teaching, his teaching was not some ethical instruction detached from who he is. He is the promised one of God. Either he brings God's promises or he doesn't. They will be forced to make the decision to follow him or reject him. And that's true for us today as well. The crowd was probably taken back at the boldness of the claim. They were amazed and perplexed simultaneously. They spoke well of him, it says, and, and marveled at the gracious words that were coming out of his mouth. They recognized the man who had grown up in their midst. And this claim did not sit to f seem to fit the man standing before him all that well. So Luke writes of the question that was on everyone's mind. Isn't this Joseph's son? How could he be the promised one of God? And part of the revelation of Jesus' identity is that he knew their thoughts and he responds to that. I wonder if that occurred to them. You'll notice that in the Gospels, when someone thinks, thinks something and Jesus responds to what they're thinking, it usually brings it with it a rebuke. And Jesus replies, however, in three ways. First, he cites a proverb that indicates that he knows what they want. They want him to prove his claims by showing them some miracle, revealing his power and his authority. They had probably heard about the miraculous things that he had done elsewhere. And throughout the scriptures, when God moves in power or in a supernatural way, you know what? There's still usually doubt. Miracles as powerful as a testimony that of what Jesus did. It, it revealed who he was and he had that kind of authority. But in the end, they were not persuasive to those who chose not to believe. And later in Luke's gospel, Jesus will point out in 1631, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Those listening must be willing to hear the word of God and receive it before they will see anything as God's work, but will look at other explanations instead. Second, Jesus quotes the proverb that a prophet is not honored in his, in his hometown. However, that would also be true of the majority of those within, his, within Israel, the very people who claimed to be the children of God and yet were blinded by the revelation of God coming to the flesh. They missed out on the identity of their creator. And this had always proven to be true as we saw earlier in Jeremiah. And Jesus knew that would certainly be true of him. And this theme is going to surface, surface continually in the book of Luke and in the book of Acts, also written by Luke. A perfect example are the words of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, 51 to 53. Let me read that to you. You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered, you who received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. And immediately after Stephen says all these things to the high priest and the members of the Sanhedrin, they prove the truth of his charges by stoning him to death. God's message is often met with rejection. And so Jesus' use of the proverb would also serve as a prediction that many of, of, within Israel would reject Jesus' ministry and they would follow another life. This pattern would continue. 
And third, in Luke 4, 25 to 27, Jesus recalls the history of Israel in the period of Elijah and Elisha. And you can read about that in 1 Kings chapter 17 and 18, or in 2 Kings 5, 1 to 14. The history lesson is a warning, but also a story that they would have been very, very familiar with. That period was a low point in the nation's life when the rejection of God was at an all-time high and idolatry and unfaithfulness were far more common than faithfulness and belief. So God moved his works of mercy outside of the nation into the Gentile regions. As only a, only a widow in Sidon and Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, experienced God's healing. The price of rejecting God's message is severe. So his mercy moved on to other, other nations, and it's foolish and dangerous to walk away from God's offer of deliverance, especially when you have entered into a covenant with him. Israel had been chosen by God to bring the revelation of Jehovah, the creator God, of both the heavens and the earth to the other nations, revealing him through their law, through how they live their lives. But when they turned away from his command, God went and found other means to reveal himself to those nations. So in light of that, this exchange with those in his hometown reveals the challenge of Jesus' ministry. But it also carries with it the, the promise, the certain promise of tremendous blessing when received but also the certain promise of eternal judgment if rejected. It's really crucial to note that there has never been anyone in all of human history that has something to offer God that he really needed. It's us who are desperate for him. So in his mercy, he came as a man, came in the flesh in a way that we could relate to. And yet men rejected the offer of an eternal relationship with the God of glory. And once again, the, the crowd does not seize the opportunity to embrace with joy the coming of the Messiah. But instead, they respond with anger to Jesus' rebuke. The suggestion is that Gentiles would be blessed while Israel reaps nothing leaves them fuming. And just like their forefathers, they wanted a king on their own terms who would restore Israel to prominence among the other nations. The suggestion that Israel was accountable for their constant rejection of God and his messengers just wouldn't do. And the truth is not that much has changed over the past 2,000 years. People want God to pour out his blessings without submitting himself, themselves to his holy word in obedience. Often when tragedy strikes, people complain that that tragedy proves that God is not a God of love, or even if he even exists at all. And this is coupled with the frustration that they expect blessings when steadfastly ignoring God's word and his commands. The crowd's reaction was rage. Listen again to Luke 4, 29 to 30. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they would throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. So Jesus departs despite the crowd's efforts to seize him and remove him from the scene. I would love to know how Jesus slipped away from their midst. There's something about Jesus as Lord that people can try to turn their back on and do away with him. But he will always be in their midst, whether they realize it or not, because he is the Lord of glory. He's always everywhere at one time. We must get used to that idea, not just out of fear, but out of blessing, not being concerned about what's going on around us, because Jesus is here with us. 
Daryl Bach in his IVP commentary on the book of Luke writes this, opportunities for God's work are also opportunities for tragedy. And that's what is pictured in Jesus' synagogue visit. The promised arrival was a great historic moment on occasion to enter into God's rich blessing. But blessing refused is tragic. The crowd's response is the first of many moments of opportunity lost in the gospel. It is another step in a paradise lost. The gospel brings a choice, and choice has con consequences. So in this last section of today's gospel, Jesus leaves behind those who are in Nazareth, who resent his claims and his rebuke, but in rage wanted to kill him. And he goes down to Capernaum. Let's read Luke 4, 31 to 32. And he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath, and they were astonished at his teaching, for his word possessed authority. In contrast to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who appealed to tradition and previous teachers that had spoken, Jesus did not cite authorities, but spoke of his own authority, the difference from the way men usually taught them in the synagogue, amazed the people because they recognized that Jesus revealed a depth of understanding that moved their hearts. He spoke as one who knew the longing they had to know God, and it was very compelling. It still is. The lesson from Luke's gospel should give us an understanding of the insanity going on around, around this country, in Canada, in Finland, and around the world, Jesus is offering a relationship with those who will receive him for who he is, the Lord of glory. This requires that they both bow down before him in repentance of sin and embrace him as Lord of all things, and then follow him according to his word and to a new life with God the life we were intended for originally. At the same time, the Lord of darkness is continually offering a counterfeit gospel that offers fleshly pleasures and promises of all the blessings in the world to those who will just reach out and take it. He's been telling that lie since the Garden of Eden, and it has always led to disappointment, misery, and spiritual death, and it never even delivers on what was promised. The real tragedy is that it also leads to eternal judgment for those who reject the offer of the cross and instead choose another path. There are only two choices here. Choose Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning. Uh, Lord, we're hungry for you. We want more of you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that your word would penetrate our hearts. That, Lord, it would bring us joy because it's your word. That it will bring us peace because you are the God of peace. And even in times of trouble, Lord, we would realize that until the kingdom comes to earth in fulfillment in the very last days when all things will be made right, we will have problems. We will suffer for being a Christian, for following you. But, but we get you. We get to know you. We get to spend life with you both now and in the age to come. Lord, let that cap make our hearts captive to all that you are. Lord, let that capitate us. Lord, I pray your blessing upon us. I pray your mercy upon us. In Jesus' name, amen.